Welcome back to Doctrine Forensics. The Word of Faith movement has ingrained itself into the DNA of so many well-intentioned believers and people. Its demonic grip is literally sending many down the path of destruction. Well, how do you say? Because of the spiritual damage caused by the mystic teachings that has gone wild and mainstream. The Word of God in particular, Mark 11, 23, and 24, has been commandeered, hijacked, and twisted by these individuals. We're going to call them the Gang of Eight. But before we give them too much credit for their wickedness, understand that they are not original at all. In this video, we're going to uncover a few key details about this movement, its origins, and create a moment of pause. Now, the Doctrine Forensic team, on a daily basis, we speak to people who have taken this false doctrine hook, line, and sinker. We collectively, on one hand, can point to other bodies of work online that are more exhaustive. However, our goal in this video, it has three objectives. One, to show that mysticism is at the root of this movement. Two, to show how this movement is not compatible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And three, how this movement manifests in bad and ungodly behavior, it leads to sin and ultimately anger with God. Once you grab your Bibles, we're going to get into why it's time to flee the Word of Faith movement in just a second. By taking a little step back in time, we can find the roots of the Word of Faith movement. The New Thought movement, also Higher Thought, is a spiritual movement that developed in the United States in the 19th century, considered by many to have been derived from the unpublished writings of Phineas Quimby. Well, who was Phineas Quimby? Well, he was an American clockmaker, a mentalist, and a mesmerist. His work is widely recognized as foundational to the New Thought spiritual movement. Now, there are smaller groups, most of which are incorporated into the International New Thought Alliance. The contemporary New Thought movement is a loosely allied group of religious denominations, authors, philosophers, and individuals who share the set of beliefs concerning metaphysics, positive thinking, the law of attraction, healing, life force, creative visualization, and personal power. New Thought holds that infinite intelligence, comma, or God, comma, is everywhere. Spirit is the totality of real things. True human selfhood is divine. Divine thought is a force for good. Sickness originates in the mind, and right thinking has a healing effect. Although New Thought is neither monolithic nor doctrine, in general, modern-day adherents of New Thought share some common core beliefs. One, God or infinite intelligence is supreme, universal, and everlasting. Two, that divinity dwells within each person, that all people are spiritual beings. Three, the highest spiritual principle is loving one another unconditionally and teaching and healing one another. And four, our mental states are carried forward into manifestation and become our experiences in daily living. Now, I promise to make this as simple as possible, but I'm definitely not going to cut corners here. So here's my effort to translate all of this in the most simplistic terms. So here's what we're going to call the Doctrine Forensics Translator. We'll start with the word metaphysics. Define means the branch of philosophy that deals with the first principles of things. Now, this is where they get things such as first fruits or the seed time and harvest teaching. Now, it includes abstract concepts such as being, knowing, substance, cause, identity, time, and space. An abstract theory with no basis in reality. So when you hear a word faith preacher emphasize that biblical principles can be applied in business and other areas, this is what they're talking about. They want the success of the Bible without the God of the Bible. Next word, positive thinking. Positive thinking is a mental attitude in which you expect good and favorable results. In other words, positive thinking is the process of creating thoughts that create and transform energy into reality. A positive mind waits for happiness, 
health, and a happy ending in any situation. Now, this sums up the entire ministry of Joel Osteen and many others. Now, when a word faith preacher emphasizes getting your hopes up, thinking positive thoughts all the time as a key to your success, this is a new thought doctrine. Now, when the Bible says to take every thought captive, not just the bad ones, all of our thoughts as believers should be examined by the word of God. Now, keep in mind, we all still have a sinful nature and unsanctified, fanciful imaginations that tell us that every good thought is a God thought. Not true. And a good example of that is, let's say you want a new house. That's a good thought. But it does not mean that God wants you to have a new house right now. Next up the law of attraction. Now in the new thought philosophy, the law of attraction is the belief that positive or negative thoughts bring positive or negative experiences or results into a person's life. Simply put, the law of attraction says that you will attract into your life whatever you focus on. Whatever you give your energy and attention to will come back to you. So, if you stay focused on the good and positive things in your life, you will automatically attract more and good positive things in your life. Next up, healing. Now, Word of Faith preachers believe that divine healing is for everyone. However, when you don't get your healing, it's your fault. Well, you didn't have enough faith. Mr. Jakes has made a fortune preaching about the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garment and has roused untold millions of women into an emotional frenzy. Now they are taught from an emotional standpoint that they too can have a miracle just like that woman. And God could certainly give anybody a miracle whenever he wants because he's sovereign. Now not to be ugly here, but there is only one record of a woman being healed that way. For the rest of us, we certainly should pray. And if that's not working, seriously, go to a doctor. Mr. Jake so often uses the woman and the hem of the garment message as a cottage staple message. I understand symbolically where he's going with that, but as he preaches it, it's just purely eisegesis where he's trying to read into the text things that aren't necessarily applicable to the believers and the readers of the text. Life force. Life force is an energy which exists in all living things. The Star Wars franchise has made a mint on this concept alone. You know the phrase, may the force be with you. That is a new thought in Hindu teaching, period. Creative visualization. Creative visualization is a term used by New Age, popular psychology, and self-help authors and teachers into context. Firstly, it is used by some to denote the practice of generating positive and pleasant visual mental imagery with the intent to recover from some physical sickness or disability and eliminate psychological pain. Secondly, it is used by others to signify the generation of autobiographical visual mental imagery by which the participant envisions him or herself in desired circumstances, commonly invoking prospective image that depict abundance of wealth, professional and vocational success and achievement, pervasive health and persistent happiness. And yes, this does apply to everyone out there with their Christian vision boards. Keep in mind, the purpose in our life is to please God and not the accumulation of things, including Mr. or Mrs. Almost Right. Finally, personal power. Personal power is a kind of mental toughness that we bring to every situation. It's the ability to take decisive and deliberate action towards a desired goal or down an optimal path that leads you to accomplish that goal. Personal power is about living life intentionally, which is one of those buzzwords you will hear in the Word of Faith movement. And it finishes by saying you live intentionally with a sense of purpose, another buzzword, and optimism. Now, this one leads to pride and leads to people thumbing their nose up at God as if to say, this is my life. I'm successful. I did this myself. This sounds all too familiar as in what happened in the garden when the serpent said to the man and to the woman, you will be like God. Hmm. Creflo Dollar said the same thing too. Now, in verse 26 and verse 27, 
God now submits himself to this principle of everything producing after its own kind. And in verse 26 and 27, let's read it out loud. Ready? Read. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now that's interesting because if everything produces after its own kind, we now see God producing man. And if God now produces man and everything produces after its own kind, if horses get together, they produce what? And if dogs get together, they produce what? If cats get together, they produce what? But if the Godhead gets together and say, let us make man, then what are they producing? They're producing gods. Now, I got to hit this thing real hard in the very beginning because I ain't got time to go through all this. But I'm going to say to you right now, you are gods, little g. You are gods because you came from God and you are gods. You're not just human. The only human part about you is this physical body that you live in. Now, all the aforementioned defined words is the belief system of those who are in the word of faith movement. Now, they're not going to come out and tell you that. Neither will they have it posted for the whole world to see. But suffice it to say, their doctrine is not new. It comes from esoteric thought and it is demonic. Well, in our next segment, we're going to get into why the movement is not compatible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. For verily I say unto you, there be some standing here we shall never taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This passage of scripture says it all.
Now that I have your attention, let's continue. Mark eleven twenty two through 24. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, Whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be removed and cast into the sea, And does not doubt in his heart, But believes that those things he says will be done, He will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, Whatever things you ask when you pray, Believe that you receive them, And you will have them. Now, to completely understand what Jesus was talking about and to understand Mark eleven twenty two through 24, we're going to actually approach this in a couple layers. Now, this is a great example of how Jesus often used hyperbole, an exaggerated statement to make a point. It was not meant to be taken literally. It is similar to when Jesus used the illustration of a man trying to remove a speck of straw from his brother's eye when he has a whole rafter or beam in his own eye. Matthew 7, 3. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or when Jesus criticized the Pharisees who meticulously kept the minor details of the law, but violated the bigger, more important things of the law. He said they were like persons eating a bowl of soup who strains out the tiny gnat in his bowl, but then he gulps down the big camel from the bowl. Matthew twenty three twenty four. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Now Jesus often uses hyperbole to create an unforgettable mental image which made a powerful point. Now no one could actually have a huge wooden beam in their eye or gulp down a camel from a bowl of soup. Neither could you tell a mountain to be lifted up and thrown into the sea. These things were not meant to be taken literal. What Jesus was telling his apostles that when they pray for God's help to remove even mountain-like obstacles that they should have faith without doubt that God would answer their prayer. Jesus also was not literally saying that they could pray for any crazy thing that they wanted and God would do it, but that the things that they prayed for in connection with doing God's will, they would receive. When you read the entire chapter of Mark 11, you will read the story where Jesus cursed a fig tree and it withered and died. Now, if a withered fig tree is an illustration of the coming destruction of the temple, then Jesus' sidetrack into faith seems random, but it's not. The temple had been the focal point of communion with God and atonement for sin for hundreds of years. This changes with the resurrection resulting in faith in Christ, bringing complete forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. The mountain Jesus is indicating is probably the Mount of Olives, which sits east of the Temple Mount across the Kidron Valley. This peak is nearly 300 feet or 91 meters higher than the temple. The sea is less identifiable. Jesus most likely means the Dead Sea, which is visible 15 miles to the south of the Mount of Olives. Now, of course, any of these choices would be miraculous. Jesus may also be referring to the prophecy in Zechariah 14 verses 1 through 5 that says at the end of the tribulation, the Mount of Olives will split from east to west and the people will flee Jerusalem through a newly made valley. Jesus promises that the disciples' demand will be met if they have suitable faith. So Jesus promises that the disciples' demands will be met if they have suitable faith. Doubt is from the Greek root word diakarino. It's the same word that James used when he talked about, quote, a wave of the sea that is driven, tossed by the wind in James chapter 1, verse 6. Now, this promise is not devoid of context. However, there are conditions and expectations attached. We must ask for what's in God's will to give. 1 John chapter 5, 14 and 15, and we must abide in Christ in order to know what God's will is, then John 15, 7 works. If we do so, our desires will match what Jesus wants, making it easy for God to answer our prayers. We must also ask with the right motive. 
James 4, chapter 1, verse 3. If we ask God to provide us with things that will give us worldly pleasures, we will head in the wrong direction, create conflict, and our prayers will not be answered. The word of faith. This, this is not the name of, I mean, that, you know, there's churches that are called the word of faith church, and that's wonderful. That's good. But it, it, this is not talking about the name of your church. This is not talking about some kind of movement. The word of faith is not a movement. The word of faith is the word of God. Every movement there is ought to be on the word of faith. And there are different streams that flow, that all of them are headed toward the same place. They're all headed towards the catching away of the body of Christ. There are those that God has instructed to major on certain things. Amen. But us being our, our wonderful carnal selves, <laughs> We get the idea that, well, you know, we're the mainstream and all these others over here, they're just kind of, you know, they're just kind of hoping. But no, no, no. There, you need, you really do need to know what you're called to be. How would you classify someone who teaches uh, deification of man uh, bringing down uh, Jesus Christ as only human, even if it was for a short period of time, you know, he took vacation for 30 some odd years, teaches kingdom now theology, and also uh, promotes the little God's doctrine of the name it and claim it word of faith movement. How would you classify All that? All right, well, let me just deal with the word of faith movement first, because that one troubles me the most, and okay. here's why. Um, the word of faith movement says that if you uh, don't have, if you're not healthy and wealthy, it's because you don't have enough faith, right? That God wants everybody to be healthy and wealthy. I think that can be refuted by one simple observation. Jesus and the apostles were not healthy and wealthy. Don't tell me they didn't have enough faith. Thank you. In fact, they, they even say that Jesus says, if they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. Paul says that if you try and live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted. So I think the word of faith movement is a problem. Also, because it gives people a false idea of who God is. God is not a cosmic candy man who gives us everything that we want. In fact, have, uh, earthly fathers don't give kids everything they want. If they do, what, what happens to the kid? The kid becomes spoiled. So you can't give kids everything they want. And God doesn't give us everything we want for our own good. So you would classify anybody who teaches those things I mentioned, what exactly? Well, I don't. Well, I, would, I would say that's... I would, you mean put a name on it? Well, it's bad. <laughs> All right. What do you want me to say? That's good enough for me. Thank okay. you very much, sir. All right. Good, good. I, thank you. I don't think we need to go any further right. than that. So thank you, everybody, for your patience. All right. God came from heaven, became a man, made man into little gods, went back to heaven as a man. He faces the Father as a man. I face devils as the Son of God. You see what I'm talking about? You say, Benny Hinn, am I a little God? You're a son of God, aren't you? You're a child of God, aren't you? You're a daughter of God, aren't you? So what, what else are you? Quit your nonsense. What else are you? If you say, I am, you're saying, I'm a part of him, right? Is he God? Are you his offspring? Are you his children? You can't be human. doesn't even draw a distinction between himself and... Never, him. never. You never can do that in a covenant relationship. Do you know what else that has settled then tonight? This hue and cry and controversy that has been spawned by the devil to try and bring dissension within the body of Christ, that we're gods. I am a little god. Yes. Yes. I have his name. I'm one with him. 
I'm in covenant relation with I am a little God. Critics, you are God. anything that he is. Yes. God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. I mean a reproduction of himself. And in the Garden of Eden, he did that. He was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not um, subordinate to God even. And Adam is as much like God as you could get. Just the same as Jesus, when he came into the earth, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He wasn't a lot like God. He's God manifested in the flesh. And I want you to know something. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifested in the flesh. We rest our case. Word of Faith preachers are common on television and have massive followings. They typically teach that God wants his people to be healthy, wealthy, and happy all the time, and that speaking right words in faith will compel God to deliver on his part of the covenant. Most believers in mainline Christian doctrine disagree. They say that the Word of Faith movement is false and twists the Bible to primarily enrich the Word of Faith leaders themselves. Now, most of them have mansions, wear expensive clothes, have luxurious cars. Most of them have private jets. These preachers rationalize that their lavish lifestyle are proof that the Word of Faith is true. Word of the Faith is not a Christian denomination or uniform doctrine. Beliefs do vary from preacher to preacher, but they generally profess that the children of God have a right to the good things in life if they ask God and believe correctly. The number one error they make is that they believe that God is obligated to obey people's words. Words have power according to the Word of Faith beliefs. That is why it's often called name it and claim it. Word of Faith preachers isolate verses such as Mark 11:24, often cited them out of context to emphasize their beliefs. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. The Bible, in contrast, teaches that God's will determines the answers to our prayer. God, as a loving Heavenly Father, gives us what is best for us and only He is capable of determining that. Now, countless Faithful Christians have prayed for healing from illness or disability, yet they remain unhealed. On the other hand, many Word of Faith preachers who claim that healing is only a prayer away wear eyeglasses, they go to the dentist, and they go to the doctor. This error is dangerous because it leads followers to a false understanding of God's sovereign nature and a faith that is unsustainable. When our faith is not built on the solid foundation of God's truth, it will easily crumble and fail. The second major error of the Word of Faith movement is that they expect that God's favor results in riches. Financial abundance is a common thread among Word of Faith preachers, causing some to call this the prosperity gospel or the health and wealth gospel. Supporters claim that God is eager to shower worshipers with money, promotions, large homes, and cars, citing such verses as Malachi 3.10, where it says to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Well, if that were the case, there are quite a number of faithful tithers, it would seem to be that to be more wealthy Christians. The Bible abounds with passages that warn about pursuing money instead of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, it says, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmless desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Hebrews 13.5 cautions us not to always to be wanting more and more. It says that we should keep our lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has says, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Wealth is not a sign of favor from God. 
Many drug dealers, corporate businessmen, and pornographers are wealthy. Conversely, millions of hardworking, honest Christians are poor. This era is dangerous because it leads followers into a life of self-centeredness and selfish pursuits, disillusionment with God, and at worst, the sin of idolatry. The third and most egregious era of the Word of Faith movements is that they believe that humans are little gods. Human beings are created in the image of God and are little gods, claim some Word of Faith leaders. They imply that people are capable of controlling a faith force and have the power to bring their desires into being, hence Kenneth Copeland. They cite John 10:34 as their proof text. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law that I have said that you are gods? This word of faith teaching is blatant idolatry. Jesus was quoting Psalm 82, which referred to judges as gods. Jesus was stating that he was above judges as the son of God. Christians believe that there is one God only in three persons. Believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but are not little gods. God is a creator. Humans are his creations. To attribute any type of divine power to humans is unbiblical. Perhaps the most dangerous aspect of the Word of Faith movement is its power to deceive and entice many people away from biblical truth. Since the days of the Garden of Eden, Satan has been effectively twisting the truth as a weapon against God's people. The believer's best defense against this cunning enemy is to know the truth through diligent and consistent Bible study. Narrators note, the people in the Word of Faith movement have enough evidence and a Bible in front of them to show them that what they believe and think is not true. The reason why they continue to adhere and like this teaching is because they love it more than they love the Word of God. Thank you for listening to Doctor and Forensics. If you like this material, please click, like, subscribe, comment, and share. God bless you and your family.